welcome to the already, unfortunately, last session of the first Indie Game Summit day. There's another day tomorrow. More talks in this room and the one next door. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Sabina Har, who's going to give you a talk titled Designing for Grief. Let's give her a big hand. Thanks, Jon, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for showing up. Um, before I start, two reminders. One of them, please turn off any noisemakers you might have turned on. And the second one is you will receive an evaluation link, so please make sure to take the evaluation later. So I want to start by a little note about myself. I am a cultural researcher and a game designer. And I'm interested in intimate experience and how we can express them through games and play. And I'm part of something called the Copenhagen Game Collective, which is a Denmark-based multi-gender, multi-interest collective of artists, game makers, indies, academics. And uh, we organize game culture events in Scandinavia, but we also make small experimental games about themes which the big players in the industry can't or won't address. So you might maybe be familiar with a 2008 darkroom sex game in which players swing custom controllers to achieve mutual orgasms. But I've been involved in projects like Lovebirds, which is a physical multiplayer beaking experience in which players wear giant beak masks to find each other's sensitive spots and make their lights flash while accompanied by live music. Um, I've also been working on a game ca called Can't Touch This, yes, you heard correctly. Uh, it's a, a meditative coloring app based on the beautiful and iconic images of T. Corrin's Kant Coloring Book. But today I'm going to talk about something different, namely a game called Jokhoi, which is about love, loss, and grief in video games. And I made it as part of my PhD research on the question how game designers can become better at designing for grief. And I made it with four Austrian women who have lost a pregnancy and who were willing to explore new ways of talking about this experience. And I found them via a self-help group for bereaved parents in Vienna. And for the tech part, I worked with an awesome student team from Aalborg University, Copenhagen. And we had one semester to make it. So, for me, bereavement and being a bereaved mother is an ordinary experience, and it's sort of part of my everyday life and of, of many lives of, of women I know, and it's part of who we are and how we explore life and how we also have fun. So I noticed that this is, although it's so common, it's also a very silenced experience. And wherever I looked, representations of it were missing, so it was very important to me to go and try to make space for it in video games, which is a medium that many people of my generation are very intimate with. And today uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges, some of the challenges we encountered while trying that out, while making a grief game. So these three challenges that I'm going to talk about today are uh, how did we include lived experience to real people into game design? Um, secondly, how did we actually translate their experiences into gameplay and game aesthetics? And thirdly, of course, what's the impact? What can a game like this achieve or how does it work in the lives of the players? But let me start from the beginning. So when we look at most games today, um, we look at death, we look at, look at loss. Death is everywhere, and uh, mortality is everywhere. But mortality in most games is also a lie, because mortality or game over means that we can try again, and this kind of trivializes loss, or it also dis disables grief experiences to, to be relevant. 
But now as an indie and someone who knows the field, you might say, there, is, there have also been other games made about the grief experience. We have games that have actually been good at portraying this experience. Just look at Brothers, for instance, a game where you explore a, an, a, a relationship between two brothers who go through magical and mysterious and dangerous adventures before spoilers. One of them dies. And you actually explore this connection of your brother relationship after death through the game mechanics and through the control scheme. And then, of course, there has been the, uh, the game called That Dragon Cancer, which uh, allows us to walk a bit of the, a piece of the way with a dad who is going through the experience of losing his son uh, to cancer. And these have been very important video games with, which have shown that uh, deep, uh, deep approaches to game making and grief exist. But they have also used a white male, cis male experience point of view to mediate this experience, to mediate grief. So, um, Game designers in the past or in the recent past have started to look for alternatives or for alternatives to this perspective as the one perspective that is supposed to, to tell us, us what to feel from um, this cis male perspective. In uh, her micro talk at last year's GDC, Henrique Lode, for instance, has argued that the majority of game developers, according to IGDA, are white, male, hetero, able-bodied, cisgender, university or college educated and have not experienced discrimination. And this is also the point of view of the heroes that are portrayed in most games. Um, so she calls them default humans and they are the one minority that is overly represented in the media, not only in video games, in power positions as the heroes of our stories and the people that we talk about when we don't use any modifiers, the normal people. So looking for non-default grief experiences, I was asking where all the bereaved mothers, sisters and daughters in video games. And in order to inv invite them, I wanted to to work with others, not only to explore my own experience as bereaved mother, but to actually work with other perspectives on it, with other women. Um, so how did we do that? When I contacted the self-help group, I got responses from four Austrian white middle-class women who, who were very happy to join the project. Uh, they were like me, uh, white enough to notice their invisibility as bereaved mothers, but unlike me, they were not interested at all in video games. They were interested in sharing their own experiences, but they did not feel safe with video games. They rejected what they assumed were video game values. They believed that video games could never represent their experience. So now I'm not the first one who has worked with people who do not like video games. Uh, game developer Brie Code has actually written quite a lot about this, and she points out that the reason she makes games with people who do not like video games um, is that it's inspiring to, to challenge the boundaries of what is now established as as game making. So, because people who do not like video games expect something else to entertain them, we have to change our paradigms of how we make games. And I was very, so, but, but the challenge was that I would still have to talk to them somehow, make a game and, and address them as design partners. So how did I do that? So I found the Muse-based game design approach by Rilla Khaled quite inspiring because 
it addresses the relationship between designer and a participant in terms of an artist-muse relationship. So the artists have the responsibility of making the game, but the muses can be there and express freely what their opinions and feelings are, and that then inspires the game design constraints. But sometimes it's quite difficult to talk freely and openly about your experience, especially if it's something as complex as your relationship to a dead child. So sometimes it's easier to do so through images, through metaphors. That's where Doris Rouge's method of metaphorical game design came in handy. So Doris says that metaphors can help game designers make something very abstract and complicated tangible by translating it into symbolic images and into a symbolic system. One example that she's shown is in her game Elude, which tackles depression. And this game works with spatial metaphors of up and down to make this experience tangible. So you go through happy and sad phases and you, there's also the option of suicide in the end. Um, But to give you an idea of how we carried out metaphorical game design, I would actually like to invite you to do a little exercise with me. Are you ready? So I would like you to close your eyes or fixate the point in front of you that you see on the slide. And now think about a person that you loved and lost. It can be anyone, it can be a lover, a friend, a family member, a pet. Um, and now think about visiting this person. Travel to wherever this person is right now and the planet where this person lives. Now, what do you see? What do, does the space look like? What do you hear? Is there something that you can do? Who else is there? What can't you do? Is there something you can't do? So, if you have your eyes closed, I would like you to ask you to open them now. So what you have done now is that you moved from a, an abstract idea of grief or what it's like to be connected to someone you, you lost or something you lost. You translated that into a very concrete image or even a system, even a, a rule set of what you can do and you can't do. And it's very likely that these images are very different. These planets are very different. At least that's what we experienced when we made, did this exercise with the, with the four women. So here are the planets that the four women made. The first planet revolves around the image of a sheep that looks across a river. And the river is separating the sheep from her son and the sheep is conflicted now, what, what can she do? She's in the observer role, but she might be able to walk through the river, but it's not time yet to do that. It's very important to stay connected and to admire the other side of the river, but there's also a flock waiting on this side of the river, which you can't see, but it's there. The second image is a cave, a very cozy cave, and in the, in the very inner cave lives the baby. And the whole family visits the planet to nurture the baby in the inner cave. And there is an objective or a rule on this planet. The baby needs to be fed or nurtured in order to be made strong enough to survive when the family leaves the planet in a spaceship. So that's, that's the uh, objective. The third planet 
revolved around a fireside and the flames that illuminated different parts of the experience, some shards and some treasures that were sometimes visible depending on where you, the parents stood and looked at the experience. There was beauty and worry in the situation depending on, on who you were, whether you were the father or the mother. And finally, we had an, a model which was all about bliss. It was about staying connected on a beautiful meadow. The atmosphere was very important. Uh, the mother and the child explored the nature while the weather changed from sunny to rainy to snowy and nothing was really harmful there. It was only about being there in a timeless way. So we had rich brainstorming materials, but how to actually translate them into game gameplay, these images. So the most important themes that we realized were there was nurturing and spending time with the babies and also the wish to have an ongoing connection, but we also wanted to make a game about grief. So we realized that we wanted uh, to first make the mother-child connection playable in a beautiful way, and then throw the player into a scenario where this connection could no longer be realized. So in Jokoi, you play as a sheep mother who explores her meadow, uh, with the little lamb until an earthquake takes the baby away. What is important here is that the lamb always follows the mother everywhere she goes. So they explore the meadow together and we wanted to express that there's an intimate connection that cannot really be disrupted. Secondly, your objective is to graze and nurture the lamb by feeding the, the flowers on the meadow. And we express this through a simple control scheme, namely left and right mouse button. We wanted to say you can care for yourself, but you can, what is most important is to care for your baby. And since the left mouse button is is conventionally more used, we mapped the act of caring for the baby on the left mouse button. So we actually want the player to briefly forget that there is something called self-care. We want them to believe that all you need to do in the game is to click left on a flower to feed the baby. We also wanted to uh, make this act of caring important and effectful, so we added consequences. So each flower has a unique color, pattern, and sound, and when the mother feeds the flower to the baby, the colors actually show up on the fur. So they get printed on the fur, on the lamb, and a melody is played also, the melody of the flower. So we kind of wanted to evoke this, this need or wish to to dress the baby, to make decisions that are important as a parent, to make this baby feel safe and comfortable. And the warmth of, and attention you give actually matters. That's what we wanted to say. Finally, the sheep mother is not alone, but it's, there's a flock waiting in the background. And, um, and, and it waits until the mother is done with the feeding and admiring of the fur and maybe changing the dress a little bit. And when they get tired from all the exploring, they can move towards the flock and lie down and cuddle. And wh while they sleep, um, the seasons will go by and players can decide when to wake up to start grazing again and explore different flowers. However, at some point in time, at a random point, there will be an earthquake. And when the sheep mother wakes up alone, there's a river, but the lamb is no longer there. That the lamb is gone means that the left mouse button can no longer be used. But when it is pressed anyways, as you're used to, the players will hear something. They will hear 
the desperate cry of the of the mother, but she won't budge. In this moment of this is what you hear. This moment of control loss was very important. But when the player remembers that there's actually self-care, they can click on the river and be able to access and look over the other side of the river. They will see two wolves, and one of them is a baby, is a baby wearing something which looks a bit like the fur the lamb used to wear. She can walk towards it by holding down the left mouse button, but all she will see is a brief message. And what she can do then is to eat the patches of grass off the flowers that now protect the flowers and can sort of nourish herself on the memories of her child. And if she discovers and takes in all the flowers that she had fed to the lamb before, she can move on with the, lamb, uh, with the flock and explore a new meadow. So this is basically the game, and I'll spoil it all. Um, so uh, we wanted to see whether this actually worked and what kind of impact this had on, on, on the mother. So we, we play tested it on, on a couple of different people. We play tested it on students, friends, but also most importantly, the muses. And it's, this is where we made a um, quite surprising discovery. So when we asked the muses for their spontaneous responses of what they thought of the game, they had very different interpretations of what was going on. The, for some, the, for some the character, like the, the wolf character, the little wolf character was an enemy that had eaten the lamb and had sort of, was the, was the predator. For others, it was clear that the small wolf was the baby, the lamb baby in a different shape in afterlife. Some players felt guilt about feeding the wrong flowers to their lamb, so it died. Others experienced the act of feeding flowers as something beautiful and meditative. Some, some muses found the game a bit boring, others found it uh, engaging. But here's the thing, what they all said is that the game resonated with their own personal experience. So how is this possible? How can something that is, has different meanings and is understood in widely different ways be relevant for, for people, personally relevant? This is where, where the importance of ambiguity came in and the idea that because we left the symbolism of the game open and didn't explain to the players what this was all about, they felt free to project their own narratives and their own grief stories onto the game and they were able to explore their own emotions like guilt and hope maybe for a connection after death. Um, and they used, basically they used the game as a canvas for projection of their own grief. So, Jokai gave them sort of a, a possibility to journey through loss through love and loss, but it did not tell them what love and love loss is. It made them, um, it gave them a platform to explore what that was. So, again, while we decided what went into the game, ambiguities, ambiguity left the details of interpretation up to the players. So here are the three ways of how we sort of tackle the challenges of designing for grief. First, Muse-based game design allowed us to include people who did not believe in video games, who thought that video games were not for them. Secondly, metaphors helped us to to not only make something, con uh, something abstract, concrete, but to translate these images in actu into actual gameplay. And thirdly, and most importantly to me, ambiguity was a way of actually connecting the game to the players' lives uh, without telling them what to feel. 
And to conclude, it's maybe most important that designing for grief opened a space for the exploration of, of different feelings and opening a space in which we as bereaved mothers did not only feel comfortable, but also visible. Um, and Joko was kind of like a monument for this visibility. But in order to make grief generally more, more speakable, it's important to create a lot of these safe spaces, safe spaces that are safe for different people with different grief experiences. So if you want to join this effort, I hope that this talk gave you a small idea of where to start. Thank you very much. I think there's time for some questions. Yeah. Um, interesting talk. When you were playtesting the game with people that had not had grief experiences, what, what was their reaction to the game? How did they connect with it? It was kind of difficult to tell what a grief experience is and what isn't. So there were um, people who, who talked um, about other experiences rather than grief. Like we could not really see, of course, if, a, if someone who plays the game and does not talk directly about their grief experience, we don't know whether they have a grief experience. But um, there were um, people who connected, for instance, uh, the role of the flock to um, the ignorant role of society, when something goes wrong, um, you were kind of left alone. Um, so there were different interpretations. I don't know if that answers your question, but... You said, yeah? You said yes. Good job. Yeah. Um, so the exercise where we closed our eyes and, and imagined uh, the, you know, the, the thought experiment that you guided us through, that seemed like exactly the right exercise to kind of help generate content uh, for an experience like this. Where did that exercise come from? How did you know to use just that one? That seemed came like the magic sauce. I came up with it. And um, I've, I felt also that, um, thanks for this question, because I think that, especially when it comes to this, to images that we, that we generate as a group, and if you have a group for, to inspire your design constraints. It's useful to use a planet metaphor because it has something in common with games. It has a space, it has an atmosphere, planets have atmospheres, planet have, planets have rules. So that, that was quite a surprise for me also that that worked so well. Cool, thank you. Um, when you were playing the game yourself, I know that obviously you were part of the design. Um, did you have a similar experience to the other muses since you've been through um, losing a child yourself? Um, it, it differs. Like I have played it a couple of times and it's different every time. Last time I played it, it was, it was really touching to me. Um, at other times, I felt it, it is too colorful for me. I would maybe prefer something more dark. Um, so, but we wanted to, to sort of represent the taste of the muses. And um, personally, I, I think that interpretations can change depending on, on your current life situation. So. As a player, you can also move into modes of where you like the game more and less, or where it makes more and less sense to you. Thanks. Thank you. You said that you had the muses like involved in the design process. Was that um, something that was like an ongoing uh, thing that you'd like show them parts of it, or what, did, when they saw it for the first time, was that like without having seen any of the development? We made them play it twice. So first we gave them an early build and we actually wanted to include some of their ideas or just also things like usability questions and consider them into, into, in the final build. So we did have like a first round where um, we just observed what worked and what didn't work in terms of usability and whether the controls were clear or not. And then the final 
um, the final round, it was surprising that they had actually forgotten a lot of things. So it was almost like a new game for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there was, uh, that was quite a process, actually. Uh, kind of a follow-up question was like, did you uh, struggle with your like input scheme as far as like working with people who are not used to normal like games at all? <laughs> like, was it hard to develop a control scheme that was like legible for people who don't play games? I guess. Yeah, I mean, if I would do it again, I think I would use tablet rather than the mouse controls, but all of them had. Uh, had a kind of basic office setup at home, so that, that's where we went for. Um, it was clear that like in the first, in the very first iteration, so we had three iterations, in the very first iteration we, we used, we just casually used keyboard controls and that didn't work at all because it's, that was too gamey. That was, that was not something that they would intuitively uh, feel inclined to do. So, so that's why we moved to something more simple and. Thank you. I think that's it. If, or is there another question? <laughs> yeah. So oftentimes, um, oftentimes when there are uh, Themes that um, themes that people are especially hesitant to approach with art, and especially with uh, with games, which have a reputation for being of a, a vulgar art, for better or for worse. Um, those those things are things that kind of exist in the realm of the highly personal, or the highly sacred, or the uh, closely connected with a particular identity, which is which can be problematic to um, to speak for, I guess. Um, I I guess um, this is why I was so hesitant to ask, is because it's a half-formed question, but it's uh, it's rooted in strong feelings. Um, do you think that for especially those matters which um, which feel important to talk about but fall well outside the realm of someone's experience that uh, that the that the muse approach is an effective way of um, of approaching these heavy topics? A resounding yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is a very clear answer because, again, my experience is quite different or the way I processed it was, was quite different from what the muses chose to chose as appropriate images for their own experiences. So I felt like, had I, did I have the chance to do this project again, I would invite people who are very different from, from my own experience because I feel that especially because you invite the muses as inspiration partners and because you have this division of roles between who creates and who inspires and who is kind of constrained as an artist and who is free as, as, as a partner, uh, as a dialogue partner. It is very, very, um, you know, um, useful to, or helpful to, to reach out to experiences that you don't, you, you yourself do, do not have or cannot even start to understand. And I think muse-based design is a good approach to starting that dialogue. Thank you. Okay, so if there's any up com up questions coming up later, I'm available for chats and I'm also available in the wrap-up room if something comes up. So thank you so much for attending. Have a good conference. <laughs>